you want to come with us on an adventure? We're going to Stoke-on-Trent. We're going to learn to make pots at the last remaining bottle kiln pottery. We're going to ride a steam train. And we're going to be the first people to visit an abandoned colliery that's been closed to the public for half a century. Are you ready? Let's go! We're on the road to heaven knows and feeling groovy Those city lights and pretty sights, they're bound to move me It's just 69 cities It's just 69 cities It's just 69 cities to like at home I've spent the last six months building a van conversion with the intention to travel to, explore and play a gig in all 69 UK cities. This series is going to be about bringing you those adventures and beautiful music of undiscovered musicians all over Britain through a series of YouTube videos. I've no idea how it's going to turn out, but I know it's going to be a wild ride. So buckle up, let's go. Molly is all packed and ready to go. Got everything in here we might need. In theory, anyway. So it is time. Oh, bless you. Yeah, you've got plenty of stuff, haven't you? I do. I am a woman. I come prepared. <laughs> so this is Rodine. Say hi, Rodine. Hi. <laughs> Hello, Binks. Binks. He doesn't care. This is my life of Binks. <laughs> Fantastic. It's all looking very nice in there. I'm very excited by the new mattress covers. We're going to test it. Yeah. And you got your Jack Hendrick shirt on as well. Yeah. Shout out to Jack. Representing, Representing the talent. <laughs> on our way to Stoke, we stopped off in the picturesque little Derbyshire town of Bakewell, home to the famous Bakewell tile. Bakewell pudding and cherry Bakewells are all different things I didn't realise until now. Rodine, what's your opinion of the Bakewell footpath? This is Rodine. She's a super kind and lovely human person. If someone's feeling low, Ro's always there for them, and she's always a good laugh. The perfect travel buddy for our Stoke on Trent adventure. Beautiful, um. Moss. <laughs> Bakewell's three tart shops can provide any hungry tourist with a fine set of tarts to choose from. The Bakewell Tart Shop and Coffee House sells four variations. You got your standard tart, your iced tart, your moist tart, and your traditional Bakewell pudding. Say what you like about Bakewell. They bake well. Embarrass me on the internet. Okay, so Rodine, what, what did you not do when you were filming? Press the record button. <laughs> Is that everything we've recorded so far? <laughs> Doesn't exist. <laughs> okay. Every day is a learning curve. It's okay. The thing is, I've used this camera before. <laughs> so I should know, but... <laughs> <laughs> Ducks, do you want to come on an adventure with me? <laughs> there may be a space. <laughs> Look at the lights. Yeah, I got some pretty lights. <laughs> it's going to be exciting. I'm really excited to sleep with the mattresses for the first time. Oh, cause yeah, you did some sewing. Yeah, I did sewing. I did good sewing. <laughs> come on, buddy. Come on. How you go? <laughs> How you go? <laughs> No, this is not a moth space. That is not the moon. That's not the moon. Oh, did you get it? No. <laughs> no oh, the, <laughs> the moth is trying to evade you. You know that threesome we were talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to put the things in for the bed. Because we've got to do this before we shut the doors up. We'll put the heater on for a little while. Warm the place up. Have it nice and toasty. I really wish we got footage of you get rid of that moth then, because that was hilarious. It was good, like that was my golden moment. I caught it. <laughs> yes, I was you like did a, too. a child of nature at one with the universe. Kind <laughs> 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 of folds out like that. Is that way? If you hold on to that one. I think, yeah. I think you've done it. So, what do you think of Chateau Harrison so far? <laughs> Chateau Harrison? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I've only managed to climb one. <laughs> 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 
too early for a TripAdvisor review. <laughs> I can't even close the door. <laughs> you need to give it a good yank. There we are. I've done that before. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put that in. <laughs> You're gonna put that in. Okay, so check this out. Um. Oh, oh cute! Yeah, isn't it? That's really cute. Look at the stars. Okay. When we were driving here, I was like, I would love to sleep under the stars. And look. Yeah, no, there we yeah. are. Your artificial stars. Yeah, you're feeling quite happy with this. Oh. When you need a wee at six in the morning. I don't, I need, don't want to talk to her. <laughs> so we went looking for a nature reserve and we haven't found it yet, but we found this view. So we're here at Leak Tennis Club. What do you think of Leak? Did you enjoy taking a leak in Leak? <laughs> yeah, this is my skate video. You ready? <laughs> That's a 180 degree ollie. <laughs> I don't know what an ollie is. It's effortless. Don't even need a skateboard. <laughs> oh, they've got their ears up. They can hear us. You know what, Sam? I'm kind of triggered that you took someone who works at a water company to somewhere called Leak. Yeah. <laughs> it's so unsteady. I've got a joke. It's possibly the best joke ever. Debatable, but well, let's go. What is your Volvo's favourite soul singer? Urethra Franklin. <laughs> wow. So we found it, we found the Gladstone Pottery Museum. Brodine, you've got some big jugs there. And we've got some insulators, I don't know what these are. So we're here, finally, at the Gladstone Pottery Museum. We're going to see the process of how pottery was made and learn a bit about Stoke, which all sounds very good to me. And we've got all these flags, because yeah, we're in England. <laughs> Just in case you forgot. Here, you are able to discover the way of life of the North Staffordshire pottery worker, past and present. So we're at the Gladstone Pottery Museum, the last surviving example of a complete bottle kiln in China factory. And it was saved from demolition at the very last minute. So the area of Stoke used to be an agricultural place, but the land wasn't actually very good for growing crops. But it did happen to be rich in the clay, water, minerals and metals that are necessary to have a ceramics uh, industry. So a cottage industry grew up. Before too long, Stoke was recognisable for these beautiful big wide bottle kilns like the ones that you see behind me. And um, they would be dotting the skyline everywhere. Now most of this is gone. This is the only remaining factory that is complete. So I'm really excited to look around it and see what's going on. Let us know if you think this looks like Lady Diana. This is a Marshall. This was made in Gainsborough. Oh, Laws known as the Clean Air Acts were passed in 1956 to help overcome the problem of smoke pollution in the industrial area. As cleaner, more efficient gas and electric kilns were used, the bottle shaped landmarks that had symbolized the pottery industry for so long rapidly began to disappear. In the 1950s, there had been over 2,000 bottle ovens. By the 1970s, only a few dozen remained. The days of the coal fired bottle oven were finally. This is so incredibly cool. So that, that shaft that was coming in from the other side is going through here. And all the pulleys would run up here. And it's driving all these different machines. It's really worn looking ropes running around everything. All these different machines are stamping different things. This is 
accepting something in water? In 1971, the bulldozers were about to demolish Gladstone China Works, where they were now standing. But at the last minute, this, the only complete pottery factory from the days of coal fire and hot lines, was saved from destruction to become a working museum of the pottery industry. Its buildings, once commonplace, now unique. Pottery has been made on this site from the 1780s, and the factory has remained virtually unchanged since 1856. In its heyday, around 100 people have been employed here. Gladstone's bottle ovens were fired for the last time in 1960, but the works were used until Gladstone China, an ordinary factory, not a household name, finally closed its doors for business. In These fire resistant containers called saggers were designed to protect the pottery from the intense heat of the kilns. And here's some old fashioned dude carrying one on his or her head. This is a hand cranked potter's wheel. Do you need a vertical pub mill? You would. This machine is designed to put the little ridges on the bottom of plates. Plaster is very much like a sponge. It's thirsty. I only poured that in a couple of minutes ago, but it's already started to react to the plastic. This is called fettling and sponging, removing the mould marks. Just give you a nice finish, really. Gets rid of all the sharp edges. And you sponge it. And when I've done that all the way round and I'm happy with it, I'll give it an extra couple of days to dry, really, in this setting. And then I'll pop them in the kiln and fry them. But I normally only fry them once to what we call the biscuit wear stage. It turns into ceramic cream. And then we sell these in the shop in the biscuit wear pool. And people can take them home and paint them. So this is the biscuit oven. So this is for biscuit firing. These are the things that they're making earlier that they fire the pots in. Make special pots for the pots, so it's like a pot in a pot. We're inside the bottle kiln, so if you go all the way up to the top, you can see the daylight come out. Here's a fellow who stacks the pots. Well, perhaps you're a drawer. He doesn't look like you he has a high rate of job satisfaction, does he? We'll have to wear several layers of thick clothing to stop yeah, let's go in. Burning, and a white rag on your head, but it's still unbearably hot. So we've just found out that like for one of these big bottle kilns to be filled and fired, it would take two or three days to fire, and then it would burn 14 tons of coal just to do one set. 14 tons, can you imagine? So doesn't it? That's so pretty. Oh wow. So these are all the moulds. So I'm guessing this is where breaking the mould comes from because you'd, you'd break the old mould and make a new one. I'd like to say a huge thank you to the 69 Cities GoFundMe backers who without them this just couldn't exist. Thank you so much for letting me do this amazing stuff folks. So this right here is all the different colours. This is how they come out. And different bits of porcelain. Apple green, water green, moss green, coral red. I'm glad that's out of your reach. <laughs> like, no. You can't take their ass <laughs> What can I see inside? Teddy bears having a tea party. Oh well, Lila put the sea feather. La la. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a bit about this radiator. How beautiful is this radiator? Look at that. Look at that casting. See, this is why modern things are rubbish. Where would you ever have that kind of casting on a radiator now? Ready? Where would you? Here. <laughs> Me and Ro then got to do something really exciting. We got to throw a real pot on a Gladstone potter's wheel. How are you getting on with it? <laughs> it's been an interesting sound. 
promoted incredibly well for her first time on a potter's wheel and through a really authentic looking pot. And then rest your arms on the side and get those hooks and hooks out. Push it to the window. Pulling the clay up and down like this helps get the air out of the clay, which is important because air can expand in the kiln and cause cracks in the pot. This sponge is designed to just get the water out of the centre of the pot to help it dry out. I am so happy with my pot that I've made and I can't wait to show my dad. I hope he likes it. So this is the doctor's house. This is where the doctor would have hung out. I'll just get my stethoscope. A sure sign of lead poisoning. She must get out of the lead. The decorating kiln. Alright, so this is... So this is where you put your fancy glazings on. Wow, look at that at the top. Fancy. Hey, hey, baby. Hey, hi. So that was the Gladstone Pottery Museum. What did you think of it? It was really fun. I like it. I love history, though, so I'm a bit of a geek. We've got a bit of history. You've made a pot, and, and I've made a pot. Some pottery. Yeah, yeah, I think we did all right. Great trip. Thank you, Gladstone Pottery Ooh, Museum. Yeah, thank you. Everyone was lovely. All the stuff were great. So yeah. helpful. So. 10 out of 10. Definitely recommend you go in there. Okay, so we're here in Stokes Cultural Quarter and we're looking for some culture. <laughs> yeah. So since we've come to Stokes, pretty much all anybody's done is danced around naked making pots, haven't they? It's pretty much the vibe here. Are we in the same place? Then? In Bethesda Square, a piece of graffiti caught our eye that read Mercy and Rain God Laughter, and we wonder what it meant. It turns out Mercia is an Anglo-Saxon name for this part of England, and the artist Robert Montgomery wanted to provide an alternative god to the Madonna statue in the corner of the park. Um, we're going to the Foxfield Railway on Sunday to, oh, to, yeah. to go on a steam train, which is going to be quite fun, I think. But yeah, my, my it's my first kiss on there years and years and years, and years ago. Oh, fantastic. So I was about, one memories for you. I was, I was about, I think it was about nine or ten then. Uh, yeah, wasn't it? Green out the other side of this building, boy. <laughs> they tend to build a car park on everything, don't they? <laughs> Thank you very much, nice to meet you, Steve. See you later, bro. Enjoy. You too. He looks like a kindred spirit. Okay, so we found a Ford, and uh, because it's very hot and sweaty and sunny, and I haven't been able to wash in a couple of days, so I think I'm just going to go wash my feet. Wash as much of myself as I can manage. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I am going to pull flat on my ass from that top of the The water is really clear, it's really cold though. It's <laughs> 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 so cold. Right, that's enough, I can't do any more. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> Okay, so we are somewhere in the Peak District in this beautiful, beautiful countryside and we're going to look for this place called Thor's Cave yeah. uh, which is a big hole in the mountain Or a hole in the wall as I just called it Yeah, hole in the wall, hole in the wall of nature <laughs> Always wash your grapes <laughs> So we're on the path that we think leads us to Thor's cave, but we're not really sure. I'm pretty sure it's that way though. We're just going to vibe it and see, and see what happens. This is our first sight of Thor's cave. Do you like one? <laughs> so Thor's cave has been formed over a thousand years by the effects of wind and water pushing against the cliff. Now, people think that the name might be a corruption of the word Tor, which means hill in ancient language, but <laughs> some people also think it might be um, to do with Thor, the Norse god of thunder. How do I retain this information? I don't know. We're 
Odina's not very confident about her sense of balance, which is understandable under these circumstances. It is quite rocky. It's certainly quite a big fall. Don't say so. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So now we've actually seen Thor's cave. I don't actually think it looks like a cave very much. I think it's just like a, a big black hole. So I think we should call it Thor's big hole. I think that's a better name for it. <laughs> what do you think? I mean, if it's a Thor from Marvel, let's discuss the holes. <laughs> Okay, so we finally made it. This is Thor's cave. How sweaty do I look? <laughs> look at this beautiful, beautiful view. Yeah, so this bit is kind of difficult because there's this bit with um, lots of interesting rocks leading up into the cave. So look at this beautiful view. So this is it. Everyone is climbing up this slippery path. I wish I could have slipped filmed a bit for you. Archaeologists believe that humans lived in this cave from the late Paleolithic period through the Iron Age until Roman times. So we've just come down from Thor's cave, from Thor's big hole. What did you think? Oh, it was alright. <laughs> it was a bit rocky. It was a bit rocky, but yeah. a bit difficult to get up to. Um, well, not that difficult. It could be worse. We give Thor's cave a 10 out of 10. So at the bottom of the hill, we found an ice cream van had arrived. <laughs> How perfect is that? After we were like, imagine if there was a Tusker that popped up at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> when I said that I want to warm with everything, she's like, oh, I think it's your birthday today. And I was like, yes, I didn't she's know like, it was. I treat but maybe you it well, is. I treat you well. <laughs> we keep finding little abandoned buildings like these. Wouldn't you love to live in prime real estate such as this? Okay, so we're here at this place called the Magpie Mine. Uh, Rodine's dying because she just twisted her ankle. Smacked my so. on the gate as well. <laughs> yeah, Rodine had a fight with the gate, but we found this beautiful mine, and we're not really sure what it is, but we're going to go explore it. Peak District is turning out to be awesome, isn't it? <laughs> well, for me, <laughs> maybe not for you. So this is the Magpie Mine. I'm just kind of blown away how beautiful this is. I don't know if you can see these yellows on the camera. She's got this sea of yellow buttercups. So this is the magpie mine. And it's, it seems like remarkably well preserved. There's like a pit headgear here. There's some winding equipment. So yeah, so mine for lead has been carried out here for 250 years. And this pit headgear was made in the 1950s. That's the most recent working of the mine. And this is where the miners would have gone up and down in their carriage with buckets of ore. <laughs> the notorious magpie murders took place in 1833 during a dispute over ownership of one of the veins. Miners lit fires underground to try and smoke out their opponents. Three miners were killed, but the perpetrators were acquitted on a technicality. However, the victim's widows placed a curse on the mine. It never made any real profit since that time, and the curse was blamed on the series of accidents and deaths. So that one thing we saw on the horizon was a horse gin. And a horse? Was it a horse or a donkey? I think a donkey? D dorse? Something used to run round this, or walk round this, and that would hoist the, the kibble up the chute. And the kibble was the ore that they mined to then turn into lead. I don't know what kind of gin I like. Shit, that was good. I'll make a rubbish donkey! So we've come to explore the house of the tree growing out of it. This is an absolute corker of an abandoned building. It's completely dry stone. There's no nothing holding it together, apart from gravity. But no, actually, there might be a bit of cement. Wow. And look at the trees growing up through the centre. That's pretty special. Got a little window up there. That's where people used to get sunlight from. I really love this wooden lintel of this old building. Look at that. It's like this beautiful curved shape. And this nail. This crack may be something to do with why the building is not 
any longer occupied. <laughs> that doesn't look like a great crack. Sam told me to do this, so don't think I'm weird. We've got nettle stings, so we're using some dock leaves to treat them. So that's what happens when you get go adventurising <laughs> in beautiful abandoned houses. Time to go, I think. <laughs> Next up we headed to the Foxfield Railway, but on our way we stopped by the Foxfield Colliery for a tour. At the time we weren't aware that on our tour we were the first members of the public to be able to tour the colliery since the 1960s. Our tour guide was absolutely fantastic, I wish I could remember his name, but thank you for a brilliant tour. I can really recommend coming here and checking it out. Your money will go to help restoring this amazing piece of history. Those helmets came in the 1960s and it's plastic. Is that yeah, fit that yeah. oh, right. <laughs> I want to draw the tension off of this joint. I feel like yeah. you could do it. Yeah, I feel like you could do it. <laughs> For about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get some helmets on because it's basically still left as it was in 1965. They were good at the colliery. The Foxfield Colliery opened in 1880 and closed its doors in 1965. Although mining has occurred in this area for a thousand years. Many of the buildings on the site have been lost to time, but what's left is full of stories. The Foxfield Heritage Railway have finally acquired the site after many years of trying, and they're working on preserving this colliery, but we're seeing it in its unrestored condition, which to my mind is a real privilege. Birds have a, a faster breathing rate than human beings. They're more affected by different gases. So they have a canary in the box, take it down every shift. You'd have 12 more canaries then you would actually use. So you have a big area full of canary birds that would be taken down. And if the canary stopped singing, or it did an impression of a dead parrot, means you've got carbon monoxide, you've got to get out. They also did try to use dogs to detect gas in the very early days by lowering a dog down the shaft. <laughs> they tried cats in some coal mines because of the rats and mice that live below ground, oh, yeah. but they died very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. One built in 1880 burned down in 1895 because someone had the bright idea of putting the oil store where all the flammable paraffin for the miners helmet lamps was actually in the steam engine house <laughs> it got so hot that the steel ropes that wound the cage up and down that shaft burned through the cage went slamming to the bottom of the shaft a thousand feet below it's lucky there were no miners underground but there were five pit ponies below ground and it took them three days to clear the wreckage of the cage to actually get them out of the pit. These headstocks are concrete, they're unique in Staffordshire, they're probably the only set left in the country. This set was built in 1945. In 1965, the National Coal Board blocked up the pit shaft and demolished parts of the mine to protect public safety. So this is the Downcraft headstock. As I say, this is a currently work in progress. Oh my god. That cage travels between seven and nine meters a second. Oh god. <laughs> it's fast. And we've got stories from here where when mines are being wound up, it's come up that quickly they've broken the legs. Each colliery had its own gauge of tub weight, so the colliery of the hill couldn't lick its tubs. <laughs> so <it's> standardisation <laughs> impossible. <laughs> While trying to get tubs to run on this, you have to make a own. So this is the upcast shaft. This is the one where they're used by the miners mostly to travel up and down. It was also used by other pit officials, because this was the posh one. <laughs> So what we hope to do in the future is have this is our experience where we can come in to this headstock through the airlocks. So this is where the miners would have come in, close these doors, and then they'd have been ready to go down. And if you look behind you, you can see a bench where the sat and waited. So we hope by the end of this year to have this available as an a, Overground, underground experience, just like the Wombles. <laughs> Maybe you have to go in here with the doors, sit on the benches, mm. and we'll turn the lights off and just see how dark it is in here. Yeah. Yeah. Be really cool. We found this archaeological, we didn't know this was here, so we went all time team on it. 
We've got two boy at this level as well. It looks precarious. <laughs> this was the control office for this. And that's going to be restored and put back into original condition. So something else to look at. Back in 1965, the colliery was sold to Team Mineral at the same time that the railway was sold to the preservationists, with a vision of a collaboration between the two which never happened. In the late 70s, the site was then sold to another company who denied the railway access, until later on, they finally managed to buy it back. Sadly, in the meantime, much history has been lost. It's a lot of trains hiding away. They're not sheep, they're sheep. <laughs> Are these parts of the winding engine down here? So that's the main crankshaft. Do you have an idea how big it is? Yeah. Sorry, hold on. You have a piston and cylinder on this side, one on the other side, and the winding drums are just over here. Yeah, they're the winding drums. Come in two hours, bolt them together. <laughs> that is... And it's lined with wood, because it's a friction fit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the cylinders are behind it. Is there an opportunity to reassemble all of any of this, or is there just too much missing? It's all here. It's just need somewhere to put it. These are the cylinders for it. Yeah, yeah. Massive. And they're they going to maintain long. that, or are they I think it's coming down. Oh, what? Oh. None of it is listed. Oh, that would be a lovely museum building. <laughs> yeah, it's either a kettle or a kibble. Because the spoil created from shaft sinking was called yeah. kibble. You want the kibble from yesterday? You give kibble to your cats and dogs, yeah. Yeah. but it's an old mining term well, the, um... for spoil. Oh, uh, okay. Like the expression, shut your trap. Yeah, yeah. It goes back to coal mining because you had kids working on the ground <laughs> opening the doors yeah. called traps. We're here at the Foxfield Steam Railway and uh, we're going to have a ride in the steam train and we're going to go out and check check out some of these beautiful trains. They've got 12 trains of preservation here. And um, it's great because every penny we spend here today, we're actually contributing to the preservation of these trains, which I think is pretty darn cool. Yeah. So let's do some, do some trains. To the trains. It's my kind of sign. So we're now on the Foxfield Steam Railway. We're quite excited to actually be pulled by a steam track. And we're in a carriage that's been lovingly restored. There's some amazing pictures here of the carriages. But this is what they used to look like. They used to be like really decrepit and then they've been beautifully restored. How are you enjoying your steam railway ride? <laughs> <laughs> At any time during the journey, or when he has arrived at his termination, the railway traveller may call to mind some important matter which he is desirous of communicating to those whom he has left behind. For such emergencies, the telegraphic wires are ready to obey the behest of their employers, and through their medium any error can be rectified or any neglect repaired. While the travelling continues his journey at ease, nearly every station has a telegraph office attached to it, so that all the traveller has to do is write his message on a slip of paper and deliver it to any station guard together with the fee, and then everything is done. It's like the text messages of Coach looks really interesting. I wonder what that is and how old it is, and if it's due to be restored at any point. It's got to be difficult to keep these things stable, you know. So here are the engineers uh, turning the train round essentially. So when we came out of the first station, 
the train was pulling us backwards. But you can't just flip a train round and you know do a three point turn. So um, what he's got to do is he's got to go backwards down a set of points, go onto another track, move forward ahead of the train, go back down another set of points, um, and now he's at the front of the train again. Very smooth. Plus, even a clunk. <laughs> This station is just absolutely adorable. Like, it's so beautiful. And a shunting hook. A shunting hook? Ah. Waking you up in the morning. The Foxfield Railway has an amazing collection of trains that any visitor can explore without the purchase of a ticket. A total of 36 locomotives are in Foxfield's care in various states of preservation. Clearly, a lot of love and care goes into keeping these beautiful machines safe for future generations. I don't know, but I'm guessing it would have had little lights all the way through it that would have told you which set of points were connected to which. Bit rusty, but it's still there. And then you point the camera at me. <laughs> <laughs> this is a train that they're running in. It's, um, it's just had some repairs done to it, so they've got to run it for a little while and get it back up to speed. Here it comes. It's making a move. <laughs> Easy does it. Oh, look how much he's pulling. He's pulling a great big oil tanker and two diesel locomotives as well. So there's a lot of power in that little train. Hey. 127. Yeah, I One think that was our carriage. Seat. Third no, class, isn't it? We had those lights, didn't we? <coughs> and that's what it looked like before. How incredible is that that they managed to restore that? train to that quality. Look at the state of this one. That's what it looked like. <laughs> yep. Aladdin's cave. Peter Green, Mark Smith and Dave Scraggs have visited a soon to be demolished outbuilding on the Kingsley Moor and found a veritable Aladdin's cave of interest to knotty enthusiasts. Food are the size of an NSR brake van still with the original knotty crest. It's the first such brake van to be identified in over 40 years. Okay. Yeah, for the naughty coach. Yeah. Now this is fascinating. What we got here is we've got a boiler on a wagon waiting to be attached to what looks like the frame of this engine over here. I don't know which one this is, but you can see the cab's beautifully restored and it's just waiting for its boiler. At the minute, they seem to be throwing coal into it. Feel a bit voyeuristic. So this is Cheadle, we're in Cheadle, and it is full of bunting. They really love their coronation, clearly. Oh yeah, King Charles everywhere. So we stopped in Cheadle, opposite a campsite, to show you this place that is just absolutely incredible. This is Les Oaks and Son Architectural Salvage. Now we, we came past this building, and it just looked absolutely nuts. It had like weird messages written on the roof and stuff. These buildings are actually modern. This building's from 1992. And it looks beautiful and old, but what it actually is, is it's all these different reclaimed parts from all these other beautiful buildings that would have been lost or destroyed that this person's rescued. And we started doing a bit of research on this fella, Les Oaks, and it's so interesting. As a teenager in the 1930s, Les Oaks began a lifelong fascination with traditional horse-drawn carts and carriages by going to farm auctions with his grandfather. He started collecting these antique artefacts, and to fund his hobby, he began a business selling scrap metal and salvaged architecture, which blossomed into this beautiful complex of unique buildings. 
real adventure land of antiques and architecture. At its height, Liz's collection contained 600 carts and preserved many museum pieces that would otherwise have been lost to time. Les sounds like an amazing fella, who I wish I could have the chance to meet. Okay, major update. We spoke, we um, had a bit of a chat with somebody, and he says we can come in and look around, even though the place is closed. We're gonna be able to come look around the buildings and see everything. Um, what a privilege. Wow. This is just incredible. Just piled high with windows and Cars. Booster, I'm not sure. Maybe. Maybe that's really separate. Wow. I hoist that load of them off. Oh my god, this place is incredible. <laughs> Which one do you pull? Like, you know? Cartwheels, slot rollers. Oh wow, check out the old door. Oh my god, look! Harrison. Don't know if you can see that, but it's F. Harrison. Can't see what he did though. Clay? The clay? Something clay. I think this might be the best video I've ever made. So much should happen in this short space of time. Look at the gorilla. <laughs> it's a piece of aeroplane. Oh, these, these pieces are off the ship. This is like the um, ships. Like ventilation shaft. Sam's favourite things. <laughs> it's supposed to come out of the church. Oh my god, the mangles. There's like a dozen mangles. <laughs> Has your mother sold a mango? Elements have come together to make beautiful art. 60 years of Queen Victoria. I wonder what this little cart was. It's like a little tender of a tiny locomotive. Oh, here's another cart. Can you, can you remember what they were, tell, they were saying on the internet about all these carts? Oh, wow. Oh my God. Wow. Just wow. I don't know what that is, but that is a very, very special machine. I'm not sure if we should go in or not. <laughs> what have we found? I think we found the best place in the world. This car. When you want the Statue of Liberty, but you don't know. It's a Renault. Yeah, it's a Renault. It's a really early Renault. Wow. What a find. So these are some of the carts I guess from this collection. Oh wow, it's a bell on a stick. <coughs> really big bell on a really big stick. Did you say it was a bell end? <laughs> <laughs> Cheeky so and so. Oh, here's more of those cars. <laughs> so these are all bits that he rescued from different places, you know? This is dispensing. Beehive. So these must just be bits that he rescued, that he loved and like put in his personal collection, you know? Got some sort of threshing machine or something. Some sort of... Right, we're gonna put... I feel like we're just winning at this trip. This trip's just been absolutely amazing. All this timber, it's all been rescued. This is my dream, just like a world where everything gets a second chance, a second life, a second purpose. I wish that we just lived like this, you know? I wish that we didn't put everything to waste. I don't know if you can see this from down there, 
at this really weird face. <laughs> Just looking at this giant wheel, and then you move a bit further along, the giant spiral staircase just lying there. <laughs> they look like biscuits, don't they? Oh look, they're millstones. These ones are millstones. I've used them before to make flour. I can't quite believe what just happened. So we're, we're parked here outside Les Oaks and so we literally just came to sort of check it out and see what it actually was. And this guy was walking past and I said to him, excuse me, is, are you open tomorrow? And he's like, oh, no, we're not actually, because it's bank holiday. We'll come and have a look around now. And if anybody asks you why you're here, just tell them, you know, so-and-so who said you could have a look around, you know. So we've been able to go around and see this place. And honestly, this is, I think this is the most incredible thing to me that we've seen so far because it's just so odd there's like so many different bits of beautiful architectural stars just mushed together into these buildings that have all been made fairly recently you know i think this is my highlight there's i don't know how anything can top this absolutely brilliant les oaks and sun if you need something beautiful for your building if you want some antique feel or whatever to it come here explore what they've got because this place is really, really special. So we're here with Molly at the Hollybush Inn. By this beautiful canal. There's the pub, that's where we're playing tonight. Really, you couldn't ask for more of a pretty place to play. Got a pretty good van companion too. We picked an amazing open mic to play at the Hollybush Inn, Denford, hosted by Liam Robertson and Nathaniel Harrison, also known as the VCs. Next up came an exciting acoustic duo called C&C, standing for Caroline and Craig, and they gave us a smashing Beatles cover amongst the fab array of other songs.
This is good times in our sailor. These chords are recycled and this melody is stolen from the shop down the road But we'd much rather steal from Tesco <laughs> 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 That's not something about ethical flights of radio so. <laughs> It was Rodine's turn next to rock the mic and she really brought it tonight with a brilliant set of covers, including this one of Kiss Me by Sixpence and on the Richer. Line up the band and play the band. 
Next up, Nathaniel of the VCs went solo to deliver this beautiful cover of Chris Isaac's Wicked Game. To finish off the night, I joined the VCs on stage and we jammed the night away. My personal highlight was this amazing version of Ray Charles' classic, What Did I Say? Tell your mama, tell your pa, gonna send you that rockin' song on the right. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. Tell me what I say. Our final mission of the trip was to check out the Lamb Park Stepping Stones. It was the perfect ending of an incredible journey, and I want to take this opportunity to say what an amazing travel companion Ro has been. 
We have barely stopped laughing, and Rose's smiling face is enough to warm up the coldest night of camping. Now, I didn't realise until we got to the stones, but Ro has a fear of water, and being unsteady on her feet, just stepping onto the stones, she was facing her fears, and she did so well. Oh, yeah, it's not that scary. <laughs> it's not that scary, is it? Go on, try number two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're on it. <laughs> Come on, three's the magic number. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're on the way back, are you? Like, okay, like, <laughs> oh my god, that was so much fun! <laughs> I know that to some people these stepping stones won't seem scary, but we all have our individual strengths and weaknesses. For example, I feel extremely traumatised listening to the music of Justin Bieber. This was a big personal challenge for her, and she decided to give it one last try. I believe in you. You can always turn back if you get scared. Well, if I turn back, I might as well do the whole thing. Do the whole thing. Do the whole thing. Go do it. Sounds good. Come on. Come on. <laughs> if the dog can do it, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is a really big thing for Rodi, and I'm so proud of her. You did it! Woo! <laughs> That's amazing, well done! <laughs> How does it feel having achieved the stepping stones? Yeah! <laughs> to be honest, it wasn't as scary as my brain made up to be, so. I can't find the fear and do it anyway. That's it, that's it. As we congratulated ourselves for our daring river crossing, further down this undulating torrent, children paddled in the shallow riverbed, marking the end of this episode of 60 Night Cities, with a huge thank you to my wonderful, warm, funny, mischievous travel partner, Ro, you rock. Happy travels, everyone. Subscribe and hit the bell, and I'll see you in the next episode. It's just 69 cities till I get home.